a reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord God, I too will take from the crest of the cedar, from its topmost branches, tear off a tender shoot and plant it on a high lofty mountain. On the mountain heights of Israel, I will plant it. It shall be put forth branches and bear fruit and become a majestic cedar. Birds of every kind shall dwell beneath it, every winged thing in the shade of its boughs. And all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, bring low the high tree, lift high the lowly tree, wither up the green tree, and make the withered tree bloom. As I, the Lord, has, have spoken, so will I do. The word of the Lord. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, we are always courageous. Although we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yet we are courageous, 
and we would rather leave the body and go home to the Lord. Therefore, we aspire to please him, whether we are at home or away. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive recompense according to what he did in the body, whether good or evil. The word of the Lord. be with you. With a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. To you, Lord. Jesus said to the crowds, this is how it is with the kingdom of God. It is as if a man were to scatter seed on the land and would sleep and rise night and day, and through it all the seed would sprout and grow, he knows not how. Of its own accord the land yields fruit. First the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. And when the grain is ripe, he wields the sickle at once, for the harvest has come. He said, to what should we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable can we use for it? It is like a mustard seed that, when it is sown in the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. But once it is sown, it springs up, and becomes the largest of plants, and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the sky can dwell in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to understand it. Without parables, he did not speak to them. But to his own disciples, he explained everything in private. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I think it was in the middle of the 1980s that there was a woman driving her Porsche and she had had a few drinks too many and she was going about 60 miles an hour in a 25 mile zone and so of course she had an accident and when that happened she killed the passenger that was with her. Um, as you might imagine lawsuits followed and when things were resolved Porsche was ordered by the courts to pay two and a half million dollars for having designed a car that was too high performance for a normal person to drive. Mm -hmm. Of course, then there's the story about the overweight gentleman with a heart condition who bought a lawnmower from Sears. And then one day while he was trying to get the lawnmower started, he had a heart attack. He is now $1.8 million richer. Thank you, courts, for Sears having to pay him that. Or you've probably heard stories like this one of a burglar who was trying to rob a school. So he climbed up on the roof, fell through a skylight, 
And when that was settled all out, the uh, insurance company for the school had to pay the guy a quarter of a million dollars, plus $1,500 a month for the rest of his life for the injuries he had suffered in his attempt to commit a crime. I'm happy to report this one, though. I learned that there's this little town in southeast Turkey named Batman. <laughs> and as you might imagine, the town council and mayor sued Warner Brothers and the director, Christopher Nolan, of The, of the Dark Knight Rises um, because they did not get permission from the town to use the name Batman in their movie. Fortunately, that one was thrown out. And the mayor and the entire town council was thrown out of their seats of office and were forbidden to hold public seat again for 35 years. So that worked out all right. But it does give you some indication that the world can really seem like a crazy place, can't it? Just absolutely insane and, and out of control and sometimes very unreasonable. And that's before we even get to the, our own personal struggles or worry, worries or concerns or issues that we have in our life. I mean, if you're not convinced that the world can seem crazy and out of control, just say some of these statements to yourself. Things like school shootings or rising depression and rising suicide rates or $19 trillion deficit. Washington, D.C. <laughs> or one of my favorites, Bay Area Commute. Crazy, just crazy. And I don't know about you, but when I look at the world and everything going on and all the stuff in my life and all the difficulties and struggles and challenges, there are just moments where I'm like, how can this be fixed? It seems beyond anyone's ability, beyond any hope, just like, and what can I possibly do? I feel like there's nothing. And I imagine in every era that's ever been, there have been people who felt that way, that things are just so crazy and broken that I can't do anything to help fix it. I imagine there were moments in Christ's life when he felt that way. I mean, if you just look at him in the gospel, right? He's living in a country at a time that's occupied by a foreign power. There's a foreign army occupying his homeland. The leaders, the government leaders in his own homeland are trying to kill him. They've made that decision. Um, the people who are closest to him, they don't understand at all what he's talking about. As we heard last week, his family thinks he's completely insane. He had to feel like, oh, this is so broken. This is crazy. This just isn't working. But he says to us, I think there's something you can do. You're not maybe as powerless as you feel. You can simply do this. Plant seeds. Plant even really tiny seeds. Sow them and let God go to work. Because just as we don't understand how the earth brings forth fruit, right? Trust God. And the blade will appear and the ear and the full grain. Just plant seeds. And it's really interesting the seed that he chooses when he says, hey, what can we compare the kingdom of God to? Compares it to a mustard seed. And we all know that image of the mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds that grows into this big bush that all the birds of the air can come to. All right, we get that. But there's something else about the mustard seed which I think probably led Jesus to use that as the example too. And it's this, that it's really ordinary. It's very commonplace. I mean, even here, if we leave our fields untended, right, mustard grows up all over the place. It's not quite a tree or a shrub, but we get mustard here. It's so commonplace, so ordinary, that in Jesus' time and ours, people just walk right by it, don't even really notice it. It's just something that's there. And I think that's saying something. When Jesus says, what can I compare the kingdom of God to? Eh, the tiny little ordinary, everyday commonplace mustard seed. See, I think he had experienced in his ministerial career up to this point the fact that human beings tend to be attracted to 
and gravitate towards the extraordinary, the powerful, the glorious, the miraculous. I mean, crowds had come to him for miracles, seeing him heal, seeing him feed all these people. They'd come to hear his profound words that gave them comfort and hope, all this sort of extraordinary, glorious stuff. However, when he got to talking about suffering and being a servant and death, eh, not so big on that one. I mean, there's something about us human beings that I don't know, I've never really met anyone who said, my goal is to be ordinary. No. For us, it's always bigger is better and more is better and extravagant is better and higher position is better and that's all human driven. And so I think unreflectively we say, well, if God is anything, God is definitely not ordinary. God's got to be extraordinary. And while that may be true, the actual person of Jesus challenges us to see God as something more than just glorious and extraordinary because the whole mystery of the incarnation is that God became an ordinary human being in a very ordinary backwater kind of place. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons he got in trouble is he didn't act like God. He wasn't very messianic. He wasn't what they were looking for. He was simply ordinary, and uses ordinary things like a mustard seed, like bread, like wine, to reveal that God's presence in God's kingdom is right here. I think often we miss it because we're looking in the wrong places for it. We're, we're looking somewhere else. Whenever I lead pilgrimages to places, I tell people, first off, be aware, if you don't find God here, you're not going to find God wherever we're going. But people like to rush off to where there are apparitions happening or miracles taking place or statues that are bleeding or whatever's going on. Let's get there and see that. And as they move off, they walk right by the homeless person in need or the struggling single mother or the teenager who's hurting or the lonely neighbor next door or the sick who could use a visit. In their desperation to find the extraordinary, they miss God's presence and kingdom right there where they are. The kingdom of God, Jesus will tell us, is right here in us. All it sort of takes is some planting and some tending, and God brings about the growth. God brings about the harvest. That's one of the reasons why, since December, I've been encouraging you to every day have 10 minutes of prayer, just you and God, you and Jesus, to tend to that kingdom that is within you, to tend to it and let it grow. So I thought this summer we would do that as a community, that we would plant seeds, that we would tend them and let God bring about a harvest. Plant seeds. You may have noticed when you walked in that in the vestibule of the church, things look a little different than they normally do. That the picture of the Holy Spirit is not there. Instead, there's this like blue triptych sort of a stained glass window that has all these sticky notes all over it. Those sticky notes are from the last two masses, last night and this morning. Here's what we're doing. We're planting seeds. You don't have to do this, but I invite you to do it if you choose to. And that is to anonymously take one of the sticky notes that's on the table there beneath the blue triptych and to write on it a prayer intention that you have. Safe summer travels uh, for an upcoming surgery uh, that someone will find a job. Whatever it may be that you would like prayer for. Then to take that sticky note and stick it up there. I think we're going to have to start using the wall not just the triptych part. That's a beautiful thing. Lots of seeds being planted. And then while you're there, or even if you don't have a prayer, please stop and look anyway, and read some of them. And see if the Spirit doesn't move you to say, oh, I can pray for that. Oh, my own father had cancer. I can pray for that. Oh, I'll pray for this one. And then put that into your 10-minute daily prayer every day. Please do not take the sticky note. Leave the sticky note on the board because more than one person may pray for something. But what you will also find on the table underneath 
are these three different little pieces of paper, prayer cards, with different prayers on them, or this one that's colored, offering different ways that you could pray, like the rosary, or reading the Gospels, or adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. And on the back of it, write down, make a copy of whatever prayer intention or intentions you will have. So you'll have this to take home with you, but leave the sticky note on the board. So that's planting a seed. And then our prayer will be tending to it. Then we'll watch for the harvest. If you put a sticky note on the board with a prayer intention, over these summer months, as that prayer intention is resolved, as God answers it, I invite you to then take your sticky note off that wall and put it on the next wall over, the one in front of the reconciliation room. So we'll have this migration of prayer intentions as they are fulfilled. And in about a month's time, I will take away the orange sticky notes and put out like pink ones. And a month later, I'll take away the pink ones, put out like yellow ones. So we'll see by color what is happening as we go through the months. So if we get to the end of summer and there's still an orange sticky note up there, we know we gotta work on that one. We know we gotta work on that one. But this is our simply planting and then tending in our prayer and letting God bring about the harvest. We're not testing God, but we are giving him a chance to show off. We are giving him a chance to show off. So I invite you today, and in every time you're here in the church, if you have a prayer, to plant that seed. If you have a heart open to it, tend to the prayers, and let God bring us a remarkable summer harvest.